Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Chris Skye, a human rights advocate born out of the COVID-19 lockdowns who was catapulated to social media fame when he was recorded at a demonstration giving an eloquent and disturbingly accurate prediction on how the Canadian government was going to increasingly take away citizens' liberties in the response to COVID. Recently, Sky has been trying to rally support against vaccine mandates and posted a Bitcoin address to raise donations. When it was shown to him how easy it was to see all transactions made to and from his Bitcoin address, he decided to give a Monero donation address a try and like the results. Untraceable, super cheap to transact, and simple. Thank you, Chris, for approaching crypto with an open mind in search for its true purpose and choosing to have your crypto debut on Monero Talk. We posted Chris's donation address in the show notes. If you support his activism, please consider sending him an anonymous Monero donation. Monero Talk starts now. Start recording. I don't, I don't want to miss anything, man. I, I, we keep it raw here on uh, Monero Talk, man. I like that. Thanks for choosing us for uh, doing your crypto debut with our show. Great My pleasure. Appreciate. Yeah, this is actually the first talk I've ever done in the crypto community, but I think it's probably one of the most important communities right now and moving forward, especially in this crazy world that we're living in. And I think it's going to be an integral community to blend with, an integral community that needs to come together with united non-compliance and help the rest of us get the hell out of this and get our freedoms back. Amazing. Dude, you speak so well. You speak so fluently. Have you always been like this? Is this like, uh, have you well, always been an activist and we're, we're just learning about you now or... Are you just some dude who, uh, you know, woke up one day and was like, yeah, the, too much. I got I to gotta take a stand. I've never been an activist. I've always been a communicator in my business. I'm in the private residential develop, design and build community. So uh, my primary purpose, uh, my primary task at work is developmental analysis. So it's about looking at projects, looking at all the checks and balances, seeing how much money they're going to cost, how much uh, what we have to get from the bank, what it's supposed to make, all the underlying costs. And this is something we're talking like tens of millions of dollars that can go over years. And there's so many underlying variables that you have to be very diligent. You have to be very attentive to detail. So I'm pretty good at that. And I'm pretty good at retaining information. And because of the the nature of my business not only have i been dealing with government since i was about 18 i got to deal with virtually every type of person i got to deal with purchasers i got to deal with owners of companies i got to deal with the workers of the company i got to deal with construction workers i got to kill with blue collar workers white collar workers i got to deal with friggin planners engineers all the different people at the towns i got to deal with counselors i got to deal with mayor so it just doesn't stop so i got good at speaking with different people because you get to realize that different types of people have different ways of communicating. So when you get communicate with everybody, you develop this universal communication that can pretty much get through to everybody. And then you combine that with my, I kind of have a weird brain that remembers everything. So once I read stats and statistics, that's why I can just talk and talk and talk. I don't need to write anything down. I don't need to read from anything. And that helps a lot with connecting to people because we're talking from the heart. And like when, I, when I'm doing a rally in a specific city, I don't even think about what I'm gonna say until I get there till I see the audience, feel out the audience, and I know exactly who I'm talking to. And that's why it's so effective because I speak the truth, but I speak it in a way that it resonates with the specific people I'm speaking with. Dude, cheers to that, man. I like to say I do the same. I ran for Congress here in New York. Same method. I'm not 
you know, I'm not a natural speaker. You know, I, I have a lot of flaws in the way I communicate. But the one thing I do well, I think, is you just speak from the heart. So same thing. I never had a prepared script. You just go up there. And uh, people really take a liking to it because they're just not used to it. They're not yes. used to hearing that, especially from a pot. I was running for office. Uh, you, maybe even more so, they're like, all right, he's just a dude. He, he doesn't even have an agenda. So um, I do have an agenda. I have a big agenda. It's called restoring our rights and freedoms. You don't, you don't have a, an underlying agenda. agenda. You're very, no, definitely not. That you're, is true. You're open with what your agenda is. So yes. what, what would you say your agenda is? And, and, and the other question I wanted to get to, before was how did you get started with all this? So you obviously have all these natural abilities. What made it turn into activism? How did what, I've been in distrust of government for a long time? I was woken up by Alex Jones when I was like 14 years old. So we're talking all like 23 years ago. I'm 38 years old now. So uh, I've been I've been always looking and researching and knowing that something like this was going to happen for a long time. The whole one world government scheme and all the rest of it, trying to take our rights and freedom, trying to consolidate the wealth and power using environmental regulations to take over our life. So I saw this coming from a while ago. My wife and I, uh, we've been traveling. We hit over 40 countries. And then last year leading up to this, we were traveling almost every month. And everyone was asking me, why are you traveling so much? I said, because soon we're not going to be able to. And everybody thought it was crazy. But I was privy to the vaccine passport probably around 2018 because it came out in a European Union document and they didn't deny what it was. They said clearly what it was. It's a passport for vaccination that's going to be required for at least international travel and probably amongst other things. And they even gave a timeline for implementation of 2021. So when all this stuff started happening, my wife and I were actually vacationing in Italy right when that became the epicenter of the viral outbreak in Europe. We were in Venice and that was the epicenter. And on the TV, they were making it seem like it was like thought of the dead plague. In reality, we we're shopping, we we're training at the gym, we we're just doing our normal thing, enjoying our vacation. So already I knew that they were blowing it out of proportion. Already I knew when they said they were going to lock Italy down, that it was going to come back to Canada. So we escaped Italy. We spent a little time in Netherlands and France just checking out how they were handling everything. And then we came back to Toronto. We got back, I think, March 3rd. And then obviously, we know we got locked down here on the 16th. So right away, I was worried about the small businesses because just like in your country, uh, we our small businesses are around 97 or 98 percent of all the businesses in the country, and they make up 70 percent of our jobs. So as soon as they did these lockdowns, I thought, holy crap, obviously Walmart and these places are going to be fine. Probably they're going to even do even better. But all these mom and pop shops, all these we have over a million small businesses in Canada, they're going to get. So the first thing I did was try to make a nonprofit to help these businesses called Back to Work, where I would literally drive to these businesses and just educate them on the bylaws because everybody was so scared. They just closed their door and like just sat there and waited. And I mean, like, you can't just sit here and wait. They're never going to let you open. Like there's rules, there's bylaws. You can still veg generate a revenue. So I would come up with what I called customized business plans for each one of these businesses and show them how to like keep their doors open, even though they're supposed to be closed, generate revenue so they can put food on the table and save dozens and dozens of businesses. I've saved people from losing their houses. And we're talking families with children and the government just doesn't give a flying. So right away, I knew this was bad news. So by the end of March, um, my wife and I saw a flyer for a protest. Now, I've never been protest in my life. I'm not politically active. I've never voted. So I don't believe in any of that stuff. And then, sorry, someone was calling from a bank on the other line. I just got distracted there. So <laughs> my wife told me we were at the protest and everybody was like a ragtag group. And for once, the mainstream media was there and they never come to any of our protests. And this was probably the very first protest. And they came for one reason, find the weirdest looking people they could to make the movement look as ridiculous as possible. And believe me, there was enough people there with like really weird signs, really messed up outfits. So they started doing that and they started trying to make the movement look stupid. So I grabbed one of the CBC reporters, who's one of the uh, mainstream media here, which is all funded by our government, by the way, in case you didn't know that. In Canada, $700 million our government gives to the mainstream media. So yeah, that's how, that's how, that's how uh, objective they are. So I grabbed the camera and I gave him shit and I said, why are you like, not interested to even talking to anybody that has anything to say. And I went through a spiel with them and everybody heard and saw me like rip this guy apart. And I was, I was just doing it out of passion. I didn't think anything of it. And they're all like, wow, you really should know what you're talking about. You should speak. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't want to be the epicenter of this. I don't want the attention. I don't want to be arrested. I don't want the government after me, et cetera, et cetera. I liked my life. My life was great. Me and my wife had a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. We were traveling the world. We were doing our thing. We loved it. So, 
there's no reason for me to get involved except my wife told me if I didn't get involved, and then everything that happened from that point on would be my fault because she's like, you have the ability to actually help people. So you better. So she put me on the friggin' marriage guilt trip. You know, you know how it works if you're married or in any type of relationship, anyone watching. So I didn't have much choice at that point. So now basically everything that's happening to me, I'm going to just blame her. She's over there right now. All right. Pretending to be asleep. Good job, man. She set you on the right track. And obviously that, that is your true passion. I mean, I, you're, you're out there, I think doing what, you do best, it seems like, right? I, I feel like I'm in my niche, or at least I have purpose, because honestly, there's no way I'm going to let them pull this shit. And if they weren't scared of me, they wouldn't have arrested me three times in the last 11 days alone. I've been arrested over, four, I think, 14 or 15 times since the start of this in 2020. And just in the last 11 days, I was arrested three times. Most recently, on Monday, they even tried to arrest me. And why? It's because I've been rallying. My term is United Noncompliance. And that means getting as many people together from all walks of life as possible getting them to agree that this is wrong, getting to the degree this is not about our health and safety, this is about control, and then getting them to agree to simply not comply out of the love for their family and out of love for their children's future. Very simple concept. It's I stole it from Gandhi, for Christ's sake. <laughs> like, and it worked for him, so it could work for us. So that's what I've been preaching to everybody. And the number one way to achieve that, we showed it already with the hotel quarantine. We had a dastardly hotel quarantine here. Which meant if you're a Canadian citizen and you went on vacation, as soon as you got back, the government wanted you to pay $3,000 for three nights in a government quarantine facility, otherwise known as an internment camp. So they want to stick something up your nose and then force you to go into solitary confinement that you pay for. And you have to wait there till you get your ne negative COVID result. Then you can go home and quarantine, but they don't even give you the money back for the other two days. So obviously, most Canadians were terrified of this and most Canadians didn't want to do it. So I came home from Turkey and I made a little video in the airport, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds, mass free, showing Canadians how to decline the test, decline the hotel quarantine, how to deal with the cops, how to deal with the health people, how to take the stupid little fake fines that are basically toilet paper and how to fight them and win. And when I did it on my own, this is why I tell people this is how important United noncompliance is. When I did it on my own, it was just noncompliance and it worked. I got what I wanted. I got through, but it didn't change anything. It didn't change anything for everybody else. But after my video went viral, millions of views, and all these Canadians saw it, tens of thousands of Canadians started simply declining the hotel quarantine and taking these fake fines. So many so that my friend got his, his court date back, and it said 2030 on it. So at that point, we knew like, these things are done. They expire in two years, but now they can't even get you in court for another eight years. So they're done. And sure enough, within a week, they announced that they're no longer doing the hotel quarantine. Why? Because of United Non-Compliance. So that's a perfect example of how it works. That's what we need to do with this vaccine passport. A hundred percent guaranteed. And it's so much easier than all these other things because with the vaccine passport, they don't even have a way to actually enforce it. I read the law. Imagine that. I didn't just watch TV or listen to my elected officials tell me. I read the law and it states explicitly, this is the number one rule everyone needs to know. Never disclose your vaccine status. Right. Not your own business. People have asked me on this show. I'm I'm totally for you know, you want to get vaxxed, get vaxxed. Go ahead. But if you ask me, hey man, none of your fucking business. Thank you. It's right. called medical privacy yeah, for a reason. It's been protected since the right. dawn of time for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Like what else are you going to ask? Uh, what's the most recent STD you've had? What's your blood type? Do you have any other communicable diseases that I should know about? Like, right. it's ridiculous. And that's why they call it medical privacy. And it says right in the law that nobody has the right to ask you. Not your government, not your employer, not a bit. That's especially not fucking business. Like, I can't even go ask my dog, my wife's doctor what her what her medical history is. But I can go ask the waitress at, at freaking a restaurant because we just went there for dinner. Ridiculous. So that's the number one rule. Never give out your vaccination status. Now, number two, no business can legally deny you service based on that because it's discrimination, especially when they don't even know what your status is. And it's none of their business to ask. So they can't deny you service. If they do, it's illegal. They can get sued and they will lose. Finally, if bylaw shows up, bylaw, not even police, all they can do is provide you an educational talk. So they tell you, oh, it's for your own good. And you know what you say? My rights and freedoms and my privacy are also for my own good. And they trump your policy. Have a nice day. And that's the end of that. So we started a campaign while everybody's worrying about the election in Canada, which is the most irrelevant election of all time. And I want to go on record and tell everybody, your vote does not matter. 
It doesn't matter who you vote for. Coke There's still going to be a vaccine passport right after the election. There's still going to be a lockdown right after the election. And you're still going to need to use United Noncompliance after the election in order to get out of this. Period. So people got to understand that. So why? And this is why they've been arresting me so much. Because I've been uniting the people. I've been telling the people, forget about the election and unite against the vax pass. We made groups in every province in Canada. And it started in BC, Ontario, and Quebec. And each one of those groups is, is businesses against the vaccine passport and businesses that won't enforce it. And we already have over 100,000 businesses in Ontario, Quebec, and BC each. So that's over 300,000 businesses in these things. That's almost a third of all the businesses in Canada right off the bat. So we have that going on. I started a campaign where I made these wonderful posters. They're 11 by 17 PDF. You can get them for free on my website, realchrissky.com. Just download them, print them. And as you go about your daily routine, whatever business you happen to go into, whether you're getting gas or at a restaurant, walk in, talk to the manager, talk to the owner, tell them to put the sign up in the door. It lets people know that they're not going to be hassled when they go there. It lets people know it's a safe zone. And it lets people know that there's freedom of choice. Because once again, I'm not anti-mask. I'm not anti-vax, even though they try to call me all these things on the news. Just like they call me a racist, but I'm married to an Asian. Just like they call me an Islamophobe, but my best friend's a Muslim imam that travels everywhere with me. Like Everything they say is a lie. Why? Because when you're telling the truth and they're only telling lies, they can't argue with me. They can't debate me. All they can do is try to discredit me as a person so you don't listen to what I say. Because if you listen to what I say, it's the truth and it's going to wake you up. So they'll talk about my hair. They'll talk about my tattoos. They'll talk about my muscles. They'll talk about virtually anything. My teeth. They'll talk about virtually anything they can to distract from what I am telling you. And what I'm telling you is we got to get rid of this vaccine passport. It is literal slavery. That's what it is. That's what this entire pandemic was brought upon. And the one way we're getting rid of it better than anything is not just uniting the businesses, but uniting our law enforcement officials and our first responders. And this is what scared the establishment more than anything. I have a very big respect in that community. They see me as someone standing up for them, even though they've arrested me more times than anybody else in the country. I still tell everybody to back the blue because I understand that the majority are on our side. And it's not hard for the government to find a stupid crony in any division to come and arrest me. So I don't hold it against them when they do it. But people need to pay attention to the fact that they have arrested me three times in 11 days and tried for number four. Why did they try for number four? We had a massive outcry from our law enforcement and our firefighters to the point where multiple officers wrote letters to their departments and to the government. And in order to get them out to the public, they sent them directly to me, knowing that I would publish it on social media. Uh, one was a female officer who wanted to remain anonymous, and I sent her letter out. But one was a, not, uh, a letter from the entire Niagara Police Department. And they were saying that they were not, uh, they were anti mandates and they wanted to uphold the charter. And I public, and they literally said at the end of the message, send this to Chris Sky. So, so they did. And I got it and I published it for them. The mainstream media went into damage control mode and tried to say that, oh, this is just a very small member of the department. They don't reflect the, the entire department's view, blah, blah, blah. So, sure enough, they wrote another letter just yesterday, doubling down and saying, oh, it is the reflection of the entire department. And we do take our oath to respect the Charter of Rights seriously. And if need be, we will stand beside you, we will stand uh, with you, and we will stand in front of you if need be. So, the officers pledged not only their allegiance to uh, their community, but to their oath to honor our Charter of Rights. And that pissed the government off. And if that wasn't bad enough, all the firefighter groups were uh, all over Canada were united by a young man named Michael Spatafora. And he wrote a wonderful, heartfelt letter that he wanted to get out there. But he was afraid to put his name on it until he talked to me. Once he talked to me, he got the confidence. He sent me the letter to publish with his name. Now you can Google him. He's well known because he became the hero of the firefighters union, as he should, because he is. So now we have all these first responders coming together to oppose this. And the government doesn't want people to know that. The government wants everybody to think it's in line and everybody against this is anti-vax. Even though the vast majority of these first responders are vaccinated, but they're still against mandates. It's not anti-vax. It's anti-mandate. It's pro-freedom. Trudeau's not going to run around and tell everybody he's anti-freedom, but that's the truth. So on Monday, there was a special protest for these first responders and civilians were not, around, uh, not invited. Except for one, me. I got the call to go there and I wanted to videotape it on my live from realchrissky.com because I get an international audience. We've had over 160 countries access my website. So when I put stuff on there, everybody sees it. 
So I went on my uh, Telegram and I made a quick video saying, I'm going to do a very special live today. You guys aren't going to want to miss it. And that's it. Just to build hype. I didn't expect that our government was going to take it and use it as a way to spin whatever story they wanted. While I was driving downtown, I was going to Queens Park in downtown Toronto to go meet up with these police officers. They ran a story on our mainstream 24-hour news channel, CP24, stating that I was planning on raiding a hospital with guns. So they literally made me look like a terrorist, and they used the hospital that was right near the protest of where I was going so they could justify arresting me when I got to the vicinity because they wanted to make sure they grabbed me before I could go live and before I could show the world that there's actual first responders in solidarity, not only with me, but within the movement. So they were desperate to try to stop me from getting this message out. And I had no idea. So I got downtown, I drove by the protest and I saw all the, I saw all the officers gathering, but it was still a bit early. So I went and parked and I was waiting about 15 minutes and I was on my phone. I was doing things kind of distracted. Finally, I looked up and I saw that I was surrounded by law enforcement undercovers, uniforms all around my car, just waiting to move in on me. So I had about maybe 20 seconds. So I grabbed my wife, dragged her out of the car. And we literally ran towards where the protest was. I'm like, if these guys try to chase me, it's going to look really bad. And as I was running with her, I got my live ready. And then as soon as they were coming to swarm me to get me, my live came out and I put the phone up. And like a frigging cross to vampires, these guys all scattered and ran the other way. And I got them on video and called them out. And then sure enough, all the first responders saw it, and there was about a thousand of them that ended up coming at the end. And they all ran over to praise me, say how I inspired them, everything that the government didn't want people to see. So the solidarity we have with law enforcement, first responders, uh, trades workers, ACTRA, the, the Actors Union, is astronomical. When they try to pretend like there's nobody against this vaccine passport, it's easily 25% of the population or more. And now we're, at, and that's why I made it a, a, I made a plea to the crypto world because if you see what's going on right now, it's all part of the co uh, the plan straight out of communist China. And I know that scares everybody, and I know people don't even want to hear it. And I know a lot of people, as soon as they hear the words communist, they literally turn off. But stay with me for a second. We have a digital identity that became law in 2021. Now we have a digital vaccine passport that's going to become law in October. They're going to link that. And now your digital ID and digital passport are linked. But now what's the next thing they're doing? If you look at the Bank of Canada website, they have a brand new job available. Somebody to architect their own central bank digital currency. Surprise! So now you're going to have a digital ID linked to your digital vaccine passport, linked to your digital currency. And your vaccine passport, as we all know, has a timer. It expires. So if you're not up to date on your vaccine and it expires, now you can't access your digital wallet. And you, when you try to swipe your ID, it's not going to work. So now they have complete control over you. The only thing missing, the Chinese social credit score. And it's coming. I got a document. Yes, but Chris, if, if we all just buy Bitcoin, a perfectly traceable ledger that can be tracked not only by governments, by corporations as well, then all that will be, be solved, right? When people say that, like I want to hurt myself. I understand the idea that, yes, if everybody stopped using fiat currency for any other type of, uh, of, of uh, medium of currency, it would take a lot of power away from the establishment. Bitcoin is a revolutionary tool. Don't get me wrong. I hold it. I've traded it. It was the first coin I ever had, and I have it in my portfolio, among other things. But this idea, you have these Bitcoin maximalists that will be like, I don't have to do anything but sit in my basement and mine Bitcoins, and I'm doing my part, and that's going to solve everything. I'm sorry, but even if that were the case, even if everybody did move to Bitcoin being a possibility, which is an impossibility, but even if it was a possibility, by the time that would happen, there wouldn't even be anything left of our country, guys. You guys got to be worried about the fact that when the government does a digital currency, the low-hanging fruit is going to be all you guys with digital currency. A lot of it. You millionaires and billionaires are the low-hanging fruit. And you guys think you're safe because you hit it on a ledger offline or you had your grandmother store it under her house or you have a lawyer hang on. Bro, they don't need to find your ledger. They just need to find you. Are you really that tough that they're going to send the, they're going to send a government hit squad to you and you're not going to give up your bitcoins or your crypto? You'll roll over in two seconds, give them whatever they want, and then they're going to kill you. So you guys got two options. Either you wait to be found and, and killed or hide or you help someone like me because we actually have a plan. 
we've been working with people all across the country. I launched what I call a Free Canada initiative on August 20th from Alberta, uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And I chose Edmonton because Alberta is the fighting spirit of Canada. And in Edmonton in particular is where we probably have the strongest resistance movement. If you're going to see one province in Canada that doesn't get a vaccine passport right away, it will be Alberta. So that's why I went there. Because we need, uh, we have a plan to not only stop what's happening, but also make sure it can't happen again. And we actually put together a presentation for people that are interested to uh, be a part of this. So it's going to be ready probably by the end of the week. And it's a foolproof plan. People will see the results with, when we start it. And I'm going to say, I can say this publicly because we're not going to be able to stop it when I do it. And all I'm missing right now is the funding. So when we get the funding and we start it, people will notice within the first 20 days that it's working. People that don't even know. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Let me interject a little bit, man. Go ahead. I, I know what my listeners are looking for. They want to talk crypto. And uh, I'm glad you're able to get all that information out there. Um, but yeah, when you do that, you should definitely ask for Monero donations. Use a Monero address. Right? I have a Monero address. Okay. I, got, I actually got a Monero donation you should right be- as I started this show, as a matter of fact. Amazing, man. It was like, it was like, uh, it was like an omen. You should be pushing your your followers and your play because you have a platform now. You, you have a following, man. Um, well, Monero <laughs> does have a very big advantage over the other cryptos. So yeah. I will. One I of the main just- points I want to get to, though, but just just I feel like you're you're frustrated with the crypto community a little bit because you're boosting- not really the crypto. I'm mostly with the big point, the maximalist. Good point. Yeah, but the maximalist, you're, like your boots on the ground, you're fighting the fight. You're the marine. You're out there. You're actually doing it right and then you have these guys behind the keyboard like yo just buy buy bitcoin i i feel with you now granted i'm be- i'm behind the the keyboard too but i've been out there like yourself when i ran for congress i feel like the monero community feels like that towards the btc maxis because they're out there they're talking about how they're pro liberty you know bitcoin's all about uh sticking it to the man sticking it to government all you have to do is pour but then it's like hey wait a minute how about the fact that you know, when everybody moves over to Bitcoin, governments can easily track and trace it. Oh, well, yeah. of course. And they can even, they're even making legislation right now that they can block your transactions. Right. And all of a sudden, so like there are these guys that are all pro liberty, pro this, but I, they're not talking about Monero. And why not? Because they don't hold Monero bags, they hold Bitcoin bags. And they're not liberty guys. I mean, some of them are, but most of them are just bag holders trying to pump. Most of them were people playing World of Warcraft and they bought Bitcoin before they really knew what it was and got lucky. Let's be honest. That's what I see from these Bitcoin maximalists. That's why they don't have any other assets besides Bitcoin, because they never had a house. They never had a car. They never had nothing. And then all of a sudden they bought $200 worth of Bitcoin and it's worth a couple million bucks. And they think they're God's gift to mankind because they got lucky. (laughs) That's what I see when I talk to most Bitcoin guys. And you can say that because I'm not biased because I hold all kinds of assets, including different types of crypto. Well, I'm a nut. I'm I'm a hundred percent Monero. And because I'm an activist, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, by me opting out, I'm trying to get others to opt out, opt into Monerotopia, you know, like, just like you say, right, with the vaccine passports, you want to stop it, everybody just don't comply. You know, you you want to change the world radically, and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, governments tracking and tracing us with their, you know, um, government issued bank crypto, everybody move on to Monero, like, just do it. it's there, the option is there, all you have to do is do it, nobody can stop you, and nobody can stop Monero. Nobody can stop crypto. So that's what I think the crypto community is trying to get across to you. And I'm sure you, you understand those. Oh, I believe I, I believe 100%. I think for, I think for monetary style transactions, Monero is number one. And I think for people who like to send donations, the biggest thing for anyone sending a donation to me is their privacy. They don't want anybody to know that that money could have came from them. And that's why Monero is very, very good for that. Monero. Even that point you made, right? Like, all right, so crypto's so great when they knock on, you know, when the feds come and knock on your door, you could say, well, you don't, you know, you don't have my keys. That doesn't even apply to anything but Monero, right? So, like, when the feds knock on somebody's door, whatever, whatever, if you reach that point in time where things get that crazy, where they're trying to confiscate crypto, they're trying to confiscate Bitcoin, when they knock on your door and they ask for your Bitcoin, and you're like, uh, I lost my my private keys, right? Because that's that's the meme in Bitcoin community, or whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's great. You lost your private keys. Okay, we, I guess we can't uh, access your Bitcoin. When they when they, a year later, two months later, whatever it is, they see that Bitcoin move. You're fucked. They're knocking back on your door. Yeah. With Monero, that doesn't exist. So it, it ties into the whole unconfiscatable nature of it as well. So there's just 
all this hypocrisy. The only way they can realistically stop Monero is if they found a way to devalue it. Because otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna be one of those things. It's gonna be like it's gonna be known as like the uh, the dark web of crypto. <laughs> right. That's what I believe. That's, well, that's with we, goes down to the point of all right. We we change that by just ignoring them and using it. Right. Yeah. You can't stop it. Right. No, I agree. I agree that they're gonna try. That's the only thing they're gonna do is try and financially to suppress it. I think the banks are gonna be pushing XRP because they believe that it's got the biggest tools uh, for control. And the, it's the most it's the most closest to a fiat style of uh, cryptocurrency that they could have. So unless somebody comes up with something completely new and revolutionary, I see them going towards an XRP or XRP style cryptocurrency being pushed by the banksters. So them getting all kinds of funding. So if they're injecting all kinds of money into that, I can see that rising as a short term investment. So we have two we have two different uh, people in the crypto world. We have some people that just want to trade and make as much money as possible. And then we have some people that are in it because. Like you said, they're in it for liberty. They're in it to try to get this decentralized currency. So that's the that's one issue with the coins because you have two separate camps that are going to be pushing certain coins one way and certain coins the other way. Most people are in it just for the money, and I understand that, man. That's yeah. the nature, and that that was the beauty of the invention that Satoshi made. It's, it's bootstrapped by greed, right? This idea that all right, I'm going to go out and try to get as many the next the next fool to buy to buy Bitcoin, so my the value of my Bitcoin goes up, and that, and that's a beautiful thing. It's the you know it was a, it was a great hack. Uh, but the thing is, with Bitcoiners, they really it's become a drug in the community where all they care about is number go up and they've forgotten the value of liberty go up Yeah. because, you know, they want their number to go up because they're getting liberty with the number. Right. But it's not really leading to liberty go up when we all port over to a currency that's now perfectly traceable and trackable. You know, yeah. so that that's where the, this show is all about. I'm constantly interviewing BTC Maxis and I'm bringing them on. And you know, I'm curious to see how they, what they say when you say exactly what you just said. Yeah. Well, like I've had Peter, McCormick, you know, Peter McCormick. He's like the big. I know him. I don't know. I know of him. I don't know. Him. I'm sure you'll go on his show. Yeah, I'm sure. And thank you for doing this show before his. We had him on here. I grilled him about the fact that Bitcoin is in private, that it's not fungible. We could get to that as well. I don't know if you if you realize that aspect. Um, and you know, no good answer. He's like, oh, you know, he, he didn't have an answer. He didn't have an answer. He said he basically said I was um, attacking him for things he didn't know about. It's like, well, well if you don't know about them, why are you on a show trying to talk about right. things you don't know about? You're out there telling the world to move over to this thing, and you're admitting that you don't understand it. So there's so much hypocrisy there. I get the feeling that you're you're not just you're obviously not just a liberty guy. You're really good at analyzing systems and getting That's to right. Getting to the root of shit. So, right. I, I, I'm. It's um, you know, positive. I see it as a very positive thing that you're looking at Monero as perhaps being the solution. That for me, that's a good sign when I see somebody like you, somebody that was predicting the direction that the world was heading in uh, a year or whatever it was, uh, 15 months ago when you went and did that first video and you said, you know, they're gonna they're gonna mandate this, they're gonna do this, and you you pretty much laid it all out. You predicted it. So you showed your 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 ability to analyze and make predictions. So uh, it's very um, encouraging to see that you're looking at Monero. And I I'm would definitely look at Monero. It's, it's to got to continue to study it. And I'm not getting paid to say this. I want to be very, very clear. 100%. Everybody knows that I'm just a normal person. I have multiple investments and in multiple things. I have lots of assets in different in different areas. So I'm just telling you that I just see it as I just see it going this way because the more the government gets tyrannical, the more they're going to scare people, and the more people get scared, the more they're going to value anonymity and all the rest of the things that make Monero special. Dude, here's what I want you to do. Obviously, I hope you keep learning about Monero and whatever resources you need from the community, we'll provide it to you because you know there's a lot of value in you talking about it. But what I what I would love for to see you do is you know go on these bitcoin shows you know take the invitations but push, push back on them about oh. the flaw of privacy and yeah. meet somebody out there because they're not having me on their show they they refuse to have me so you go on there and I, i'd love to hear what they they what, all want to have me until they actually have me on their show then i think they're not going to be too yeah. happy that they have me on their show what do you think about the fungibility aspect so this idea that you know a good currency uh digital cash Digital gold, right? Because that's the meme with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. digital gold. Uh, Saifedean, he invited you on his show. He wrote that book, The Bitcoin Standard. Bitcoin is the new gold. 
Where's the chapter in that book on fungibility, right? When you look at gold, what makes gold gold? One of its core attributes is the fact that every atom of gold equals every other atom of gold. Exactly. It's fungible. You know, every dollar equals every other dollar. It's fungible by mandate, by mandate by the government, essentially. But Bitcoin, it's 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 not, right? You have this traceable ledger and effectively one Bitcoin doesn't equal the next because they all come with the history attached to them. That's and right. that history changes the value of each That's coin right. depending That's on right. what that history is. That's right. right. A virgin Bitcoin doesn't have a history. That's that's as high value as you can get. One that was sent to you from, you know, Osama bin Laden's nephew. Osama bin Laden's nephew probably isn't going to be as worth as much. You're probably not. Somebody's probably not going to want to accept that Bitcoin. Exactly. Like that's what I my my biggest deal with getting people in the crypto community that want to give me donations and want to give me money is finding an anonymous way for them to allow me to donate. And that's that's supposed to be the entire part of crypto is the anonymity. But when it comes down to it. You got to do a lot of little tricks to actually make it anonymous. Yeah. Unless you're sending yeah. Monero. And anonymous, you know, the privacy nature of it, right? So yeah. That fact. That, that is obviously a huge fact. Uh, but but the fungibility, the privacy, you know, is a product of that, right? You're yeah. getting that privacy or you could look at it the other way, the fungibility. But just the fact that one unit equals every other, which allows this free flow of commerce, right? Because now you can not have these companies, these companies that are literally funded with hundreds of millions of dollars to track and trace Bitcoin transactions, to try to make predictions uh, on, on the market, uh, to basically implement KYC AML and make sure that, you know, everybody's following the proper regulations. And all of that goes away with Monero, right? Yeah. All of that goes away and you just can't do it. And what does that lead to? It just leads to uh, a more free economy, the free flow of it's more like money. It's more right. like money. Let's just put it that way. So what do you think of this concept, you know, where people are uh, worried that Bitcoin or Monero really might be regulated out of existence? Anything's possible. And that's that I touched on that a little bit when I said I think the banksters are really going to push XRP because when the banksters get behind something, they don't like competition. So they are going to try to get rid of a lot of coin. And I'm sure that there's so many coins on the market now, the majority of them are just going to fizzle out. Dude, oh, the yeah. XRP, man. Do the XRP, I, I get what you're saying in terms of it possibly being a good investment for the reason. Yes. Yeah. Hundred yeah, yeah. uh, percent. Hundred percent. But you're, then you're betting. You're betting against liberty. You're right. betting with the banksters. You're betting against liberty. But you're making a bet that could have potentially a shit ton of returns. Because yeah. let's look at Bitcoin. How much higher is it going to go from fifty thousand? Even if it goes to a hundred thousand, you just doubled your money. If XRP yeah. goes to a thousand bucks or ten thousand bucks, then you made a lot more money than if you did if you were holding your Bitcoin. Are you familiar with uh, atomic swaps? You know what atomic swaps are? No, I don't actually. So it, it's this ability to transfer between coins. So Bitcoin to Monero, this okay, technology yeah. was just invented. BTC to XMR atomic swaps. You have Bitcoin, I have Monero. We could use an atomic swap to, and I could send you my Monero. You can send me your Bitcoin completely decentralized. It's not on an exchange. It's not even using a decentralized exchange. It's just using an atomic swap, literally chain to chain and, uh, and using a, a kind of a, a, um, a smart contract in between, allowing us to exchange without any third party. That's, That's awesome. Makes it unstoppable, right? So now it's like, so all the, these calls for, or, or these concerns that, you know, uh, can be regulated out of existence, can be stopped. I, I disagree. You know, I, I'm on the side of it can't be stopped. And the only thing that can stop it is this false belief that it could be stopped. So well, if people it, get behind it, it can't be stopped. The narrative from governments that we're got, that we can stop it and we're going to stop it. That's what will like, kind of scaring people out when in reality, if people just non comply. Right. Like, no, then it can't be stopped. It's not it's it's true. Stopped. It can't be. If people use it, it can't be stopped. If they can scare everybody from using it, then it could be stopped. So when I say it's possible for it to be stopped, that doesn't mean it's probable. That doesn't mean I believe it's going to happen. But in my opinion, virtually anything's possible. But that's what they're going to try to do because they're not going to like it. They're not going to like the fact that we have another medium that we could use privately. They're not going to like the fact that more and more people are going to be using it. And they're not going to like the fact that they're going to they're going to they're going to say it's the the money laundering uh Bitcoin. That's what they're going to call it. The money laundering crypto. That's how they'll try to demonize it. Can I send you one of these hats, man? On me? Of course. Mo Narrows, Mo Liberty. No, that is no problem. <laughs> I'll put my, I'll put the 
let, let me send you one of those. Oh, what happened? I just lost them. Shit. Sunita, I just lost him. Should I? Oh, oh he's back. All right, nice. Okay. Sorry. I, 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 I didn't know what happened, man. I thought, you know. I, I was typing that. in my address and I hit the button and I put. I got out of the, uh, I hit leave studio by mistake. I thought they busted through your door over there. That was it. No, no. Last we would hear from you. No, I hope not, man. <laughs> if I go in again, I don't think they're going to try to let me out, though. I don't, they, they already said eight bales is uh, quite a bit. Dude, I, I don't know where you're getting. I mean, I could say I know where you're getting the energy because I like to believe I have the same. But, you know, I, I look I look around because I'm so into this, man, on, on a liberty level. And you and you do look at, take a look around. You realize there aren't that many people that actually truly believe in these ideals, which is, which is sad to see. You know, it's because changing, I, man. It's people changing. People have gotten so comfortable and they're just like, well, it's not really affecting me personally. So I pitch Monero to people and I just see their eyes glaze over sometimes. I'm like, oh, but you know, you know, you don't want to be surveilled. You don't want governments to be able to see your transactions. They're just like, I don't care. I could go buy my groceries. I, you know, I could go home, watch Netflix. Life is good. Like I'm getting all my needs are met. Like, what are you talking about? But those are people that are never going to have money to, to put in Monero anyway. Those are people that are not going to understand. Those are people that aren't ambitious. No, Those but people even people with money, man, people with money, they just don't, they don't see liberty as, obviously they believe in liberty, but not until it's really taken away from them. And they don't realize, a lot of people don't realize that it is being taken away from well, them. Well, that's what I told you. I said, as more and more people see the tyranny unfolding around them, you're going to see more and more people jumping to Monero and other cryptos, 100% guaranteed. That's happening already. It's happening at an accelerated rate. And especially if you go... If you're going into the states right now and you go into places like Florida and Texas, these places are taking in all the people that are movers and shakers from all the other places that want to go and have freedom. And now that they're bringing them in, I know guys that are going from all different states and they're ending up in places like Miami and Texas. And they're massive crypto traders from all over the world. So these guys are all concentrating in these areas. And it's going to create a very, very, very interesting situation in the United States. Because we're gonna have, we're gonna have certain states that have all the power, all the money, all the wealth, all the innovation, and then we're gonna have certain states, thanks to COVID regulations, that are gonna be basically dead. Why do you stay in Canada, man? Why, why don't you why don't you go somewhere else? Uh, because I want so many charges, I can't get into the states. Even though my wife's an American citizen, otherwise I would love to go over to the states. I'm looking at a lot of different options because, to be honest, if they, if we don't beat the vaccine passport. I will leave the country at least in the short interim and I'll be elsewhere and I'll be fighting the good fight from elsewhere because there's no way I'm living under the tyranny of not being able to go or do anything until, unless I give them my papers, please. That's just not happening. Where do you yeah, think I, one of the, the, the more liberating places to live? Obviously, you mentioned like different states in the U.S., Texas, Florida. Florida, Texas, uh, Mexico is good right now, to be honest. Costa Rica is good right now, to be honest. All the supposed third world countries where they haven't implemented all these massive technocrat technocr control grids are doing a lot better than everywhere else. And especially if they're places that actually uh, get by on tourism, because then if you're there and you're there and you're looking like you're on vacation, you just get treated better. Like if I'm walking around Mexico, they're not going to bother me to wear a mask because they're going to think I'm on vacation. <laughs> Dude, your book. Um, are you selling it? For Monero, can you can you put a Monero option there? For I should. That's what I'm. Oh my god, I never thought of that. Yeah, man, let's give me an going. amazing idea. All I gotta do is put my wallet up there, and the people can just yeah, yeah. We could, we could try to help you with that if you need any help. So yeah, I'm gonna get you in touch with my help. web guy. That's a great yeah. idea because that would be a great way to actually support the crypto community as well. Because yeah. right now it's all PayPal and. Uh, you know, people may not want the world to know that they're buying your book. You're, yeah, you're, love, you're a controversial guy. You know, PayPal, who knows? One day you may wake up and that thing might be turned off. You know, oh, they, buddy, they already did that to me. You know how much I struggle to keep my PayPal active? I try to get all the money out of there as soon as I can because all they want to do is keep your money in there and make sure you can't access it. It's pretty scary. Yeah, yeah. So where do you see this all go, man? I mean, so where, where you're, you're obviously... Um, concerned about the direction but what Buddy, i'm not concerned anymore because i already saw everybody wake up i can't even drive from point a to point b anywhere in canada i'll get stopped in traffic people will knock on my window and try to take a picture with me this is showing me that people are awake and they're aware and they're unhappy because if they know who i am it means they're awake period you don't know who i am unless you know what the hell is going on 
So you are you optimistic then ultimately? I am so optimistic. All we need right now is when we get a couple people to step up and provide the funding required for the initiatives that we have set out and the plan that we have created that's going to be national, we're, we're, we're attracting investors that are from all around the world because people understand that Canada is the forefront of this fight. If Canada falls, the U.S. will be next. And if the U.S. goes, then Europe and the U.K. are done, and then they've won. But if Canada stands up strong and Canada becomes the example of freedom for the rest of the world, the tyranny will be beaten back in every other country and we'll literally have a golden age around the world like we've never seen before. So we're having we're having people from all industries, from all different countries coming forward and saying they want to help Canada. So we actually put together a presentation that's going to be ready this week and we're going to be hosting these meetings for influential people with the resources and the connections that could actually make this work. And we're going to be doing them probably for the next week or so. And by then, I already know I'm going to get the funding we need because there's so many people that are against this. And when they hear the plan, it's pretty much foolproof. And as soon as we start getting a little bit of the plan going, people are going to see the results right in front of their face, literally right on TV. And there's nothing the government's going to be able to do to stop it. And that's why I can speak freely about it because it's not illegal. It's not immoral. It's not unethical. It just uses the truth. And it uses the resources required to spread the truth around and combat their uh, their lies and their narrative. And it is going to give people the tools they need to secure themselves in their employment and secure themselves in their uh, school without having to worry about their vaccination status. And it's going to give help to all the freedom groups around the country as well as it's going to really take over the municipal elections. Because right now, that's one of our biggest problems. All the municipal elections in Canada, they 90% of the people are hand selected by these crony politicians and then they run unopposed completely. And that's how it all I know, that, I know that all too well, my man. I know yeah, that. of course I, you do. I, I work for a municipality here in, in New York. And you know, then you know all it takes is a, all it takes is a little bit of seed money for a for an opponent that's actually lived in that county for 20, 30 years, and they will crush the incumbent. It's that simple. And when you can do that across the country. And you're simultaneously building up the freedom groups while taking over the municipal elections, while hooking up all these massive unions like the CN Rail with the type of lawyer they need to overturn the uh, the illegal dismissals. It's going to be like a domino effect. And all the other wrongful dismissals are all going to back off. All the people are going to back off the mandates. And once we beat that vaccine passport, we'll beat the other mandates. We'll stop the business closures and we'll end these lockdowns. Then we'll be able to get rid of the freaking government with a vote of no confidence, and we'll be able to install a proper government full of people from the private sector, because that's the problem with our government. We have 338 ridings in our country, and all 338 are occupied by public sector parasites that have no career, no nothing, and are beholden to special interests. And when the lockdowns came, they were granted special status where they're the rulers and we're the slaves. And we have any wonder why when it came time to vote to extend or end the lockdowns every one of them voted to extend so imagine we can replace those parasites with private sector people people that actually had skin in the game people that actually have roots in the community people that actually have a, a business acumen that could actually run uh without a budget annual budget deficit and actually put prosperity into their communities and above all would never ever vote for another lockdown we call the initiative a free canada and it's a lot it's a multi-pronged approach but it, it's going to happen very quickly, very concisely, and they're not going to be able to stop it as soon as we get rolling. Yeah, I mean, the, the parties just control the candidates, you know, and I, I had that when I ran for Congress and it was a little bit of a hack. I knew I've known, known the party well. It's been a very long play for me. And uh, I got them to give me the basically tap me. The Republican Party tapped me to run. And uh, what they didn't realize is I wasn't going to speak their narrative. I was going to yes. speak my own. And we did better than anybody expected, ultimately with not too much help from the established party. Because uh, once they saw how I was campaigning, they were a little concerned by it. And after the election, uh, I got a lot of flack for it, man. I got a lot of flack from uh, this, the party that's supposed to be my own uh, for doing things differently for campaigning in minority areas was their, was their major criticism. Um, imagine that. Imagine yeah. that you're trying to appeal and help yeah. everybody. Yeah, because yeah. they, they didn't think that was good for the party in general. Disgusting. Uh, so, dude, this is just the way it is. It takes, but it, it's just so hard. And this is where crypto comes in because a lot of people in crypto, the cypherpunks, the crypto anarchist thing is just all about, you know what? It's not even worth trying to 
you know, be a, a front, you know, a front facing activists out there trying to change things through democracy, uh, you know, through running, running for office. It's just that it's not going to work because it's the system is just broken. The system doesn't work. So but what we have to do is build some kind of technology that's essentially going to undermine it. And that's that's kind of the the thinking, the cypherpunk thinking. Do you think there's there's a lot there's ultimately truth to that? Or do you think uh, that's pie in the sky and it, and it won't work? Uh, I think it it can work. Do I think it will work? That all depends on how much effort people put in and how much they try to stop it. We're at a very special crossroads right now with crypto. There's a lot of coins that are going to go they're going to go all over the place and then they're going to have different special interests trying to capitalize manage or try to destroy certain coins so like i said this is going to be it's going to be like war in the crypto world pretty soon <laughs> to be honest that's what i'm foreseeing among crypt cryptos versus cryptos is what you're saying cryptos yeah. versus cryptos being fueled by special interests yeah i mean BT btc maxis are definitely currently winning that war you know well, yeah for now yeah, yeah. I think for I I don't want to say this and really upset people, but I think for all the people that are into BTC, it's like a giant hourglass, and it was and it's had its time, and it's pretty soon when we see all the pressure on all the other coins, that hourglass is going to flip, and slowly but surely, Bitcoin is going to slow very slowly lose its power over the industry. It still might rise in value. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's going to go broke or anything like that, but I think it's going to lose its general influence and its general luster. In the industry, well, ultimately, the establishment seems to be okay with it, you know, because you I know, should scare when, you. when they're there on the floor of Congress, you know, uh, they're talking about it, you know, a year ago, two years ago, and there was the concern it's used on the dark markets. That are, oh, well, actually, Congressman, don't don't worry about it. It's perfectly traceable, so it actually helps us fight crime, which is great. You know, yes, fighting crime is great. But you have to think of what the implications are with that and why yeah, or why that means governments aren't fearful, right? So uh, it becomes much easier to make sure everybody is perfectly taxed if they're using a perfectly traceable currency, right? So that I think that's their larger concern, not even so much crime. It's this idea that they don't want be people to be able to, you know, uh, opt out. And, you know, maybe uh, they, they don't want to leave it up to... The honor system with things. Well, even with, with Bitcoin, with the new regulations they're going to put in, they're going to even be able to block your transaction. Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're, you're talking about through mining and stuff. Yeah, they're trying to make regulations through the government that not only can they trace the 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 uh, yeah. transaction, but they have to they'll be uh, able to approve or disapprove them. Yeah, we, we've already seen this. We've already seen miners that say they're going to be compliant and they're only going to validate transactions uh, that aren't on the blacklisted list. There you go. And yeah. when you have to validate a transaction, then there goes the whole decentralization. Right. So, so Bitcoiners will argue all day with you on how that's impossible. But uh, the fact is, when most of the Bitcoin mining is done by ASIC miners, uh, which are these very this specialized hardware that, you know, only... Uh, that you or I wouldn't have access to at this point. Uh, it's mined in warehouses, like, you know, tremendous warehouses. Like, it, it's not mined on people's computers anymore. It's not mined by people. No, it's Monero is, by the way. I don't know if you know about that. That's a whole nother amazing feature about it. But Bitcoin, it's mined by these major miners that are companies, that are large, yeah. tremendous companies. There's only a few of them essentially now at this point. And so, yeah, you look at the hashing power. Oh, it's using this much electricity. It's using all this hashing power. It would take, you know, 100 supercomputers to try to, re you know, reverse a transaction. It would take either that or knocking on the door of the 10, the 10 mining companies that control all the miners in the world, the CEOs or whoever it needs to be, and saying, hey, guys, if you want to continue to mo run this huge mining operation in our country, you're going to have to play by these rules. So it's not even uh, as decentralized as as it appears. And not deregulated. Now it's getting regulated, which is the, the death knell of any currency. Yeah. Are you familiar with the whole mining thing? You, you know Monero's mi how Monero mine? I have no idea how Monero's mine. I knew how Bitcoin was mine, but I don't know much about Monero except for the, the privacy aspects of it. Well, I got to tell you, because this is huge, man, because nobody even gets to that point, right? We're always talking about how Monero's private and that's... But one of the other major things is Monero is all about being decentralized and unstoppable, right? Bitcoin supposed to be, but like I said, it's 
it's tending towards centralization with, with ASIC mining. What Monero's done is also proof of work coin like Bitcoin, but they created a proof of work algorithm that essentially you cannot create an ASIC for. And it's, it was a breakthrough. It was a, very, a breakthrough. This guy, Howard Chu, super intelligent guy and, and, and some others uh, came together. They invented this and, it, and it's working. So basically the, the most efficient way to mine Monero is with the CPO. That is the ASIC of Monero. So what has that done? That allows people, anybody who has access to a computer, to mine it without permission to start mining. You know, whether they're in Venezuela or wherever they are, they can mine Monero and they can compete in the mining mining network. As opposed to Bitcoin, you know, you're in it's Venezuela, you to mine, to mine on your computer, you're not going to, you, you can't, you can't compete against the, against the ASICs. And it creates a more de decentralized mining network so that it can't get to the point where governments say, hey, miners, we need you to do this because how are they going to knock on the door of the miners when they don't even know who they are or where they are? Especially when there's too many of them. Exactly. So dude, I, we, we covered a lot and I greatly appreciate you choosing Monero Talk to kind of do your crypto debut. My pleasure, man. It's a it's it's one of the most exciting coins that's ever been created. I'll give it that for sure. Awesome, man. Is is there anything else you want you want to bring up uh, in terms of crypto and what you're doing? And I talked about everything that I'm doing, but I, I we're gonna update people next week once we actually start doing the presentations and once I know that I, and once I've actually got the funding in place and I've actually unleashed the plan, I'm gonna let people know that the plan has started and to be watching. And people are just going to have to watch the mainstream news and watch the social media. And they're going to start seeing stories change. They're going to start seeing narratives change. And they're going to start seeing things happen that don't make sense. Any more specifics <laughs> about what the plan is? Any more? Uh, what exactly? It's going to be a combination of uh, taking uh, taking over the media, pro providing people legal help that they need across the country that's going to challenge all these government edicts oh. in, in a way that's going to make them roll over. And then it's going to combine also increasing the... Uh, the viability and the uh, reach of the freedom movements all across the nation because there's so many of them and they just need a little bit of help and they'll all grow exponentially to the point where it's going to hit fever pitch. So you're trying to get funded by groups. Every, everybody in any industry that has connections, money, or, and to, to get this done. So we're talking to uh, construction people, oil people, crypto people, generational wealth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Virtually and anybody that's on the page that they understand that no matter how much money they have, this is about the future of their children or their grandchildren. And the future does not look bright unless we fix what's going on. You think people are going to be concerned with, you know, providing you with these funds saying, all right, it's, it's not, how, how is this one guy? Yeah, gonna they're not just gonna be brought we, have a, we have a conglomerate, we have a conglomerate and we have, uh, there's, there's a few people I've been working with, obviously, on this. It's not just myself. I wouldn't be able to do all this myself. And we have various types of accounts that will be able to take money. We have various types of wallets. I created a whole bunch of anonymous wallets because I know I was getting a lot of people that wanted to donate. And their main concern, of course, is privacy and not being able to have it traced back to them or traced through me because they think that I'm a high-value target, which is true. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that uh, they're on the level of trying to do anything uh, financially to me yet. But like I said, we take every necessary precaution in every way possible to not just protect ourselves, but protect anybody that's involved with it. Because the most, the number one thing that everybody wants uh, that's funding this is they want to be left out of it. They just want to basically give us the money and let us do our thing, unleash us on the friggin' on the on these people. And that's what I want because I'm up against the ball with like it's like I'm up against thousands and thousands of people with unlimited amounts of money, and all I got is my big fucking mouth. Just to, just to continue to be the devil's advocate a little bit. So, but when they look at your plan, are they going to say, "All right, uh, sounds like sounds great in theory," but you know? No, when they look at the plan, they're going to be like, "They're going to be like, this makes perfect sense, and this will work." And when they see that, even with just a little bit of seed funding, within the first few days, they'll start to see results from that. It's going to pick up like a like a steamroller because the networks are very very vast. So when one person starts talking to their friend and they see what we said we were going to do and it works and it starts having the effect that we say it was going to have, you're going to see people jumping off the sidelines like crazy and it's going to be a tidal wave and we're going to wash away this corruption and all these evil, sinister intentions and we're going to get our country back. And then Canada is going to be an example to set for the rest of the world. 
Now, I know at the outset you, you mentioned one world order or whatever. Is, what do you think is actually happening? What is Okay, when I want to be clear on that because when people say one world government, you look at them and their eyes glaze over like it's a movie and there's some supervillain that's going to come in and take over the world. No, everybody, every country is still going to have their own leader, their own government. But what they're going to do is they're going to agree on one basic rule of law for all the countries. And how do they do that? I don't know. They have a little organization called the WHO, and all it does is disseminate information that people are supposed to use as their new policies, and they have one agency sending these policies to every country in the world. So if every country in the world is getting their policy direction from the WHO and follows it to a certain degree, are we not going to have a de facto one world government where virtually all countries have almost one rule of law? We're not taught, and then once they do that, yes, they can start obliterating international borders. Yes, they can start uh, ma uh, making new fiat currencies or new digital currencies that are now combine continents. Like now, we can have a whole North American digital currency when they uh, when they restart the economy, and then they could do one for Europe, and then they could do one for Asia. They're trying to they're trying to consolidate wealth and power, and this is how you do it. I lost you. Welcome to my show, guys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're who you want to see anyway, man. They want to see you. They don't want to see me. Um, dude, you cut out. So I'm going to have, hopefully it recorded it. Uh, so I missed half of that rant there on the one, but I, I, I get the concept. You're saying, you know, it, it's not going to look like, you know, a Batman movie where it's just uh, one evil dude control. No, it's, it's, they get their information from one agency, the World Health Organization, and every country follows their policies. So if every country is following the policies of one of one governing body, you have a de facto one world government. Yeah, so that's what we're seeing. Heard of the FATF? What's that? It's the Financial Action Task Force. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Mean, they're not really a you know, they're basically an entity that that all governments, essentially most governments, listen to when they when they make their regulations with regards to. Uh, banking laws, KYC, AML, all that stuff, you know, comes from these recommendations that that the that the FATF makes, and they all, world, and they set them worldwide. So now they, we have they one bank to it. Everybody just listens to it and adopts it. So you have a banking sector that's setting international regulations for the world. Now you have a health sector that's setting regulations for the world. So how do you not have a de facto one world government? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it definitely appears to be moving in that direction, which is why uh, decentralization is so, so important and very important. These technologies that basically, uh, you know, can't be centralized, which are the, which are the ones we need mo the most, I believe, you know, I agree 100 percent. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. I think I think we could close it out. I feel like I've 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 picked your brain enough. Like I said, one favor when you do go on the Bitcoin shows. Just push back, man. Ask them about. I always ask the tough question that, it, that it's not private, that transactions can be. Uh, I always ask the tough questions. I always ask the right questions and I always get the right answers. Thank you, man. I appreciate your candor. Appreciate everything you're doing. Um, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, we, we need more people like you that are out there just fighting the good fight without a hidden agenda. And it appears to be the fact with you. So I don't have any hidden agendas except that I want everybody to be free and I'm willing to fight for it. If that's an agenda, uh, so be it. Cheers, man. I hope to meet you in person one day, man. Definitely. As soon as they let me into the States, I'll be there. My wife's an American citizen. So we'll have you, uh, we'll invite you to the Monero conference. You know, if you could come, that'd be awesome. I would love to, if I can get into the States, I, they, they're trying to invite me to the one that's happening in Mexico. I'll actually be able to go to that one. So that'll be really nice. Which which thing in Mexico? I believe there's a I can't remember what it's called some crypto conference some crypto convention I was told about from a couple of people that they wanted me to go there and speak in person so I'm looking forward right. to that. Did, my other favor to you, you know, you obviously make up your own mind when you look at this stuff, but be careful with with pumping, uh, you know, things that really shouldn't be pumped. You know, obviously if it's about making a dollar, sure, but uh, you know, you do have a platform. People respect you. They listen to you. You ultimately are. I don't pump yeah. anything. I give my own personal opinions I, on why I think something has advantages and disadvantages, and then I let people make up their own mind. So take a good close look, and when you know, so when you speak about it, uh, it, it matters, man, because people are listening to you. So, what do you think about NFTs before you leave? 
Uh, NFTs, I think is a lot of it's BS. I think it's, um, I'm more in interested in fungible tokens than non-fungible tokens. That's why I'm interested in Monero. Like the NFT thing, I, you know, you could right click and copy it, right? Like, so, uh, you know, I'm going to get it. There's, there's going to be criticism there, but I'm just, don't, you know, I'm not, I don't really get that, you know, like you, you don't hold, you, you hold uh, essentially the deed to something, right? but it's something digital, right? Yeah. So if I could just copy it, I could basically have most of the value that that thing is offering, right? What if someone made an NFT that had an actual physical coin with it? Uh, well, people are trying to do that with, so like, let's say a piece of artwork, right? So this piece of artwork, it's a digital NFT, but maybe it's, it's embedded into a physical piece of artwork, like things like that, I think are cool. Cause then when, you know, you have a painting hanging up, yeah, like, then you actually have something tangible. It, and then the NFT is embedded in the, like that, that makes sense to me. Just a purely digital NFT doesn't make really the, the main reason it doesn't make sense to me is because we're not all on one protocol. We're not all just using, if we're all just using Ethereum, then maybe that makes sense, right? But I may have some picture, the Mona Lisa NFT on Ethereum, and then the other version of the Mona Lisa NFT is made on some other, whatever it is, Cardano, or whatever one of these other things that you could do NFTs on. So whose NFT is, is who really has the non-fungible token? The guy who owns the Ethereum version of it or the guy who owns it on some other blockchain. It's so like having a hockey card from two different manufacturers. Right. It's like having the Topps hockey card. And an OPG version. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, maybe, maybe once one protocol, or if it works out that way, one protocol really becomes the underlying protocol that we all run on, the underlying decentralized protocol, then maybe building NFTs on top of that would eventually make sense. But we really don't know which one that's going to be. Obviously, Ethereum people think it's Ethereum, but, yeah. uh, you know, I think it's Monero. <laughs> all right, man. Greatly appreciate you doing this. My pleasure, man. I, thank you. And to everybody who thought I'm afraid to come on a crypto talk, Dude, obviously I'm not. You're extremely fearless. I don't think anybody uh, sees fear in you. Um, where can people learn more about you? Follow you? I was trying to, you know, figure out the best myself. Trying to figure out the best place to find your content. Uh, the best place is uh, right now. There's an Instagram account that shares all my stuff. It's Chris Sky eighty three. There's a, my Telegram, Real Chris Sky, all capitals. My website, realchrissky.com. And uh, you can uh, you can get that PDF that I was talking about there if you're from Canada to put in the stores. My book's on there. Whenever I'm doing a, a, a major event, I go live from that website. So I always post the links. And you can see on the website the link for my uh, Twitter and Telegram on there if, you're, if you don't have either of those. And I'm, all, I'm also on Twitter under Chris Sky. We should mention that's kind of how we met. I, we yeah. Got we Twitter got, is amazing for the crypto community. Yeah, we got you to put up the Monero donation address there. So anybody yeah. listening to this that will, you know, uh, aligns with what Chris is saying, throw him some Monero, man. Throw him, throw him, a, you know, throw him something. Nobody, nobody's gonna know. Nobody will know, <laughs> except you. All right, man. Thanks, brother. Cheers. It was a pleasure, honestly. Thank you, man. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.